In the last video, I made a raster generator out of a Z80, an EEPROM, and a couple of support chips. The goal here is to recreate the video circuit that the ZX80 and ZX81 used in the 1980s. In fact, the video circuit was one of the reasons the machine became so cheap. Now that we've created a stable image using the Z80, the next goal is to try and get a decent image size, in this case, 256 by 192 pixels. Remember that the goal of this stage isn't to have the perfect final solution. It's to just introduce another step towards becoming a ZX8081. In each video, I'll introduce a new trick that Clive used, and hopefully we'll end up with a usable machine. This is the prototype I built in the last video. It's running off a simple 555 clock circuit. But here we can see the address counter going up, and we can see that the data and sync lines are active also. Unfortunately, I think this is about as far as I'm going to take this breadboard design, and I'll switch to perfboard in this video. The machine consists of a Z80 connected to an EEPROM, and then two data lines are tapped off to form the video and the combined sync signal. This is the overall circuit diagram, and note that I've got a 13 MHz crystal oscillator connected to a 74HC161 counter to divide the frequency to get down to 3.25 MHz. Conceptually, we can think of the Z80 memory space as being a 2D array, and we break that 2D array into three areas unused, inactive, and active. Each row in the memory is a scan line, so this gives us a total active area of 32 by 192 pixels. We add in some sync regions, and then at the end of each scan line, we jump to the next scan line. We keep going until we hit the bottom right. And then we jump all the way back to the top left. We use the complement A instruction for sync and the rotate right A instruction for data. This is what the machine code for a typical scan line might look like. Now, this machine's horribly inefficient. We only have 32 pixels across and we require a byte of memory for each one bit pixel. The first thing I'm going to try and do is reduce it from one byte per pixel to one bit per pixel. I'm still planning to use the same basic layout, but this time I'm going to load a 1 bit per pixel image of resolution 256 by 192 pixels into the active area. Because it's 1 bit per pixel, this means each byte in the memory contains 8 pixels within it. The dot clock is twice the CPU clock, and we have 4 clock states per no op, which means there are 8 dot clocks per no op executed. This means there are 8 pixels per byte fetched by the CPU. Rather convenient, isn't it? With this design though, we're going to run into some trouble. Z80 will try to execute this stored image data as random instructions. In this case, the first bytes are all 55 hexadecimal, but really it could be anything. 55 hexadecimal is load L into the D register, which is going to be benign in this case, but overall, the machine's not going to work. What we need to do is store this image in memory and present it to our video circuit, but we want the Z80 to see the exact same region of memory as being 00, zero hexadecimal, which is the no op instruction. This is the single most important point in the video, so let me repeat it. What we need to do is store this image in memory and present it to our video circuit. But we want the Z80 to see the exact same region of memory as being 00, zero hexadecimal, which is the no op instruction. What sort of circuitry do we need to achieve this? Well, I'm sure many people watching this are familiar with the 74HC245. But for those remaining who haven't memorized the entire 7400 series catalog yet, don't worry, it will happen. For now, though, the 74HC245 is an octal bidirectional buffer with trice 8 outputs. So, what does that mean? Well, it has two sets of 8 bit connections, bus A and bus B, and two control lines. These are labelled output enable bar and direction. Let's talk about output enable first, which is pin 19. Imagine there's a switch on each connection to bus A and bus B. When output enable is de asserted, which means it's set to 5 volts, then all of the switches are open, and it's as if the device is completely disconnected from the circuit. Bus A and Bus B can't communicate with each other through this device in this state. But when output enable bar is asserted, 
all of the switches close, and bus A and bus B are now connected to the chip. Once enabled, its function depends on the direction signal coming in on pin 1. If the direction signal is low, then data is transferred from bus B to bus A, but when direction is high, data goes from bus A to bus B. So the first trick up my sleeve is to divide the main data bus into two smaller buses, which are going to be separated by a 74HC245 buffer. Data can flow from one side to the other in either direction, and it can also be blocked in the middle, and the two sides can act independently. Before, we were just using raw data clocked off the data bus to feed the video circuit, but now we're going to need to break down each byte into individual bits, then display them one at a time in a sequential order. The chip that I'm going to use to do this is the 74HC166 shift register. The idea is that we present an 8-bit value in parallel to the input of the chip. When the load signal is held low and we receive a positive edge on the clock signal, then the data on the 8 input bits will be latched into the 8 internal flip-flops. Note that the H input will directly be outputted through Q7 at pin 13. This is basically how we load a value into the shift register. Next, we go into shift mode by setting pin 1 high. Then when we receive another positive edge of the clock signal, the data stored internally is shifted one position to the right, and now what was our G input during the load is being outputted on Q7. For each rising edge of clock, we shift right another position. This takes the byte that was presented in parallel and converts it into a bit stream that's shifted out sequentially. This allows us to take our byte stored in main memory and convert it into 8 different pixels. We continue doing this until all 8 bits have been shifted out. Then we apply 0 volts to the load signal and a new 8 bit byte is read into the flip flops. Now remember we have this stored image in the EEPROM that we want the video circuit to see but we want the Z80 to see 00, 0 hexadecimal or no ops at the same memory location. So on the Z80 side of our bus divided by the 74HC245, we put in place a no op generator. This actually happens to be another 74HC245 with one of the buses tied to ground. This is enabled during the first half of the scan line. Then on the EEPROM side of our dividing buffer, we put a 74HC166 shift register where its output then feeds the video circuit. If we superimpose the scan line at the top, then during the first half of the scan line when A5 will be set to zero, we want the buffer in the middle to disconnect the left and right sides of the data bus, and we want our no op generator to push zero, 00 into the Z80. At the same time, we want the image data coming from the EEPROM to go into the shift register. Then, in the second half of the display, when A5 is set, we want to turn off the no op generator and enable the buffer which will transfer instructions from the EEPROM into the Z80. This means the EEPROM stores image data for the first half of the scan line and it'll store code in the second half. But it's a little hard to see it from the circuit diagram, so let me show you in a bit more detail. First, one thing we can do is exchange our no-op generator for a set of eight resistors tied to ground. This is very much like the no-op generator we used in the first video. In the first half of the scan line, the Z80 will be disconnected from the EEPROM and it sees all the reads as no-ops. In the second half of the scan line, the 74HZ245 in the middle will be enabled and it will overpower these resistors quite easily and the instruction code from the EEPROM will get to the Z80. This is all good and well, but there's actually another configuration that'll work. That's where we use the 74HC245 as the no-op generator, but we have resistors connecting the left and right sides of the data bus. In the first half of the scan line, the 74HC245 in the no-op generator is active, and it'll drive zeros into the Z80. But the EEPROM can still output data that will go into the shift register. It's just that there may be a voltage drop across these resistors and a current draw of 5 milliamps. Obviously, this only occurs for all the high signals coming out of the EEPROM. Not ideal, but it works and it's cheap. So the Z80 sees the no op, and the shift register sees pixel data. In the second half of the scan line, the no op generator is turned off, 
So the EEPROM is the only device driving the bus, and there should be little or no voltage drop across the resistors. Let's try to correlate this block diagram with the ZX80 circuit diagram that's available online. The Z80 in the left is represented by this chip titled 780 in the schematic diagram, which is an NEC clone for the Z80. The EEPROM's over here on the right. This bank of resistors in the middle, which divides the bus into two, can be seen here on the schematic diagram right next to the CPU. I use the 74HC166 shift register, while the ZX80 uses the 74HC165 shift register. These are very similar chips, except for how load works. So, where's the 74HC245 knob generator? Well, these chips might have been a bit expensive back in the day for Sir Clive, so instead, they decided to use some 74LS05 chips. These are open collector inverters, and in this configuration, with an inverter feeding them, they're essentially acting the same as our 74HC245 based NOOP generator. We can see it here in the lower left hand corner of the schematic diagram. Some of the eagle eyed amongst you might have noticed that the wiring is slightly different for the ZX80. The NOOP generator and the shift register are both directly connected to the CPU, and I'll go over why this happens in the next video. But for now, I'm going to wire up the way I've shown it here in this block diagram. Here was our original design from the last video, but now I'm going to add in a knob generator and the resistor bank. I want to add in the shift register, but before I do, I need to make some other modifications to our circuit. We need to generate CPU clock bar and dot clock bar. I can do that with a pair of inverters. We can add our upgraded clock circuit here on the upper left part of our diagram. Next to the knob generator is an OR gate that turns it on when A5 is low and M1 bar is asserted. This is when the CPU is doing an instruction fetch from memory, and this is when we want the NOOP. The other thing I'm going to need to figure out is how the load signal on the 74HC166 is going to work. I really need to be able to generate the load signal from the Z80 output signals, and if we look at the Z80 timing diagram, we see that the CPU load instruction occurs here which is on the rising edge of the T2 cycle. Now, I know that this is when the output from our EEPROM will be accurate, so I want to load the shift register on the same clock. This means that the load signal going into the shift register needs to be low for a period of time leading up to this positive edge clock, and high for all other periods of the instruction cycle. At the moment, I can't see any simple combinatorial logic that I can use to make this load signal. If I OR together M1 bar, CPU clock bar, and read bar, then the signal will be low here and here. But what if I use a D-type flip-flop and delay M1 bar by one clock cycle? Now I can easily detect the second half of cycle T2 using an OR gate. In practice, it's a pretty straightforward circuit using half a 74HC74 and half of a 74HC32. I add these to our circuit diagram down below. Now that I have the clock signals that I need and the load signal, I can go ahead and add the shift register to the circuit. The output from the shift register just feeds directly into the emitter follower circuit that's used to drive the video signal to the display. When we go back to our original block diagram, this part of the data bus that's connected to the Z80 can be seen here. Well, on the right hand side of the data bus, we see the EEPROM and the shift register. This is represented here in the schematic. I modified the sync circuit a little bit, and I'll go over that in more detail in the next video. The last thing we need is a flip-flop to detect when A5 is set during the fetch cycle, so we can clear the shift register and generate our border blanking signal. I've decided to start using perfboard instead of breadboard for the remainder of this build, and so I really need to start from scratch. Here I'm connecting up the NOOP generator to the Z80, some address lines in blue. Now I'm going to add the EEPROM and the bus dividing resistors. One side of the resistors goes to the Z80, and the other side goes to the EEPROM. I need to wire up the address lines to the EEPROM. Some of these address lines are going to go to some other chips which I'll cover in more detail in the next video.
Off camera, I've added in the shift register and the other logic required to make the circuit work. So let's power it up and see if it runs. Success. Here we go. A one bit per pixel image of the Sydney Opera House. Steady as a rock. At the moment, we have a bitmap display, which uses at least six kilobytes of memory just for the active region alone. One way to try and reduce the memory footprint is to use predefined characters stored in ROM, and that'll be the basis for the next video. Hopefully you can see that we're moving towards a ZX8081 design, and we'll take a step closer in the next video.